Have you ever had a calamity befall you? Something really terrible happens and you were completely blindsided by it? Or perhaps worse, you made a series of decisions that led you to a bad place in life where you just felt miserable? Have you ever experienced what you might describe as a miracle or a blessing? Have you ever felt an overwhelming sense of peace, joy, or comfort? or been able to do something that not only felt important and valuable, but gave you a deep sense of fulfillment? I've personally experienced all these things and I've come to realize that they were all the results of one thing. All the best and worst moments in life, successes or failures, good or bad fortune, missed opportunities, or dreams come true. I attribute it all to whether I pay attention to or ignore just one thing. When I hear most people talk about things like off-grid living, homesteading, self-reliance, preparedness, short-term survival tactics, or long-term survival and sustainable living, I just don't really hear them talk about this. And for me, it's the most important thing. It determines whether I feel like I'm stumbling blindly through life or whether I'm gracefully floating through, whether I feel trapped and helpless or confident and free to be myself and live life on my own terms, whether I'm burdened under a mountain of stress or rising above it to live my very best life, whether I'm judging others and putting them down and making them feel bad, or lifting them up and helping in a way that actually makes a positive difference. You see, it all comes down to one choice that determines the outcomes in my life. And in fact, it affects everything around me, including the animals I live with, the plants, the land I live on, and the people who are part of my life. Hey, UV. <laughs> All right, well, UV and I are here. We're about to make a trip to the vet. The uh, medication they gave her, like it seemed to help a little bit while she was taking the medication, but she still seems to be having a little problem with the eyes, kind of rubbing it, it's kind of squinty. So we're gonna take her in to have a more thorough exam. So wish us luck. Living with animals has taught me a lot of things. One of those things is how to be a leader. To properly care for an animal, you have to know what's best for that animal and you have to provide guidance for the animal so they can live their best life. Because honestly, they don't always know what's best for themselves. They act on instinct and just do what comes naturally to them. And that serves them well in a lot of ways, but they still have a limited understanding of the world, and that can get them into trouble sometimes. Okay, we're over here at the vet's office, and I think she recognizes where we are. I don't think she's particularly happy about being here, but uh, we will see how this goes. No problem. I know this is the way. It's okay. You got it. I know. She was just here. Hi! <laughs> Hi! How are you? It's okay. I think she's a little unsure of the floor. Yeah, there's nothing to grip on, huh? <laughs> Yuvia likes eating other animals' poop. She also likes drinking dirty water out of puddles. She enjoys exploring and chasing animals. And she seems to be afraid of larger dogs. So when she sees one, she acts defensively and tries to fight. She might not understand that these things could end up getting her injured or sick. And one of these bad decisions might have caused the problem with her eye. So it's up to us to work with her, training her and guiding her to help keep her safe and healthy. Well, I just got back home and then I almost literally got a call right away saying that Yuvia is ready to be picked up. That's what happens sometimes. Time to head back into the city and Let's pick her up. Even the greatest intellectual mind has a limit to its understanding. Because of its limitations, the mind tends to approach the world from a place of fear and insecurity. It can lead us to be defensive or reactive, and it can come to the wrong conclusions, which ends up hurting us or others. <laughs> <laughs> 
Who's that? Who's that? <laughs> there you go. Like, she's ready. She's ready to get out of here. Yeah. You guys need anything at all, give us a call, right? All right, thank you. All right, thanks. Have a great one. Have a good day. Bye bye. <laughs> you ready to get out of here? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Let's get out of here. <laughs> a mind can really be a powerful tool, and I think that can serve us well in life, but I don't think that we should be a slave to it. Well, we're back, and Yubi's hesitant on getting out of the vehicle. Uh, might be uh, some of the, still a little drowsy from being put under or something, I don't know. Just like I wouldn't want my dogs making important life decisions for me, I don't want to rely on my mind alone to lead me on the best path in life. If we want true happiness and freedom and the assurance that we're making the best choices, there's really only one thing we must do. Resting up. So it's been interesting uh, taking Yuvia into the animal hospital. Everything's new to her. She was a little scared. And I'm sure coming out of the hospital, she was a little loopy. What they told me is that they kind of put her under. They really flushed the eye very thoroughly. They didn't see anything in the eye. The eye itself looks really good. So they don't really know exactly what the problem is. They, I think they did an injection. They put an anti-inflammatory injection into the eye and the eyeball itself is fine. And uh, I think she's looking a lot better after the treatment. It's been a little bit now since that hospital visit. I think it's a lot better. I don't know if it's 100%, but definitely way better than it was. It was good just to get peace of mind that there's nothing seriously wrong. Yes. With these monsoon rains, I mean, things are growing out here like weeds. Well, a lot of them are weeds. <laughs> <laughs> Pigweed is growing like crazy out here. Look at this field. It is amazing to see. Now, while it's amazing to see all this greenery, once this does go to seed, it makes it incredibly difficult to walk out here. It gets the prickly and thorny and everything like that. So actually this sea of green right here is where I cut it down before. And you can actually kind of see in the background where I didn't cut it. You can kind of see some dead stuff poking up. I'm gonna cut this stuff back. I'm gonna cut as far as I can and just get a bunch of this done. Obviously I'm not gonna do this in one sitting. I just got like a weed whacker that I'm using. <laughs> so I'm just gonna kind of do this in between projects. I'm doing it as best I can, but it's just basically going out there with a uh, weed whacker cutting acres. Yeah, maybe not the most efficient way of doing that, but I think it's okay for right now. In the future, we'll have other ways of managing that, I'm sure. You want me to get uh, some better equipment for that? Uh, I was thinking more along the lines of animals. Ooh, interesting, all right. Working with these weeds, once it gets established in a field like that, it's really hard to get rid of, and a lot of farmers have problems with managing that. But we can kind of view this as an opportunity or take advantage of that because these are edible weeds. We could be eating them. Or, you know, if we got animals, maybe they could be livestock fodder. One of the tricky things about the soil here is that it's hard clay. It's very resistant to absorbing that water. So having that organic matter turn into soil is a little tricky here. Things just sort of dry up on top of the soil and it doesn't really mix into the soil. That's another good thing about actually letting some of the weeds grow because these weeds in particular tend to be good for breaking up hard clay mm -hmm. soil. Mm -hmm. And just kind of observing and, and learning some things about the stuff that's growing out there. These weeds supposedly grow in areas that are rich in like nitrogen and phosphorus. So, you know, it's likely that our soil has a lot of nitrogen in it. I think the issue for us here is getting more water, <laughs> like holding that moisture in the soil. Getting it into the ground where it's needed most. And what's cool about this is it'll provide kind of like a living mulch in this area and it will, you know, we'll take advantage of this growth and it will feed the soil. So this will kind of provide sort of like a chop and drop permaculture method 
and help improve the soil out here. So you can see this nice patch of pigweed, not really the best of names, but it's a very nutritious plant here. You know, just with all this pigweed and grass growing, it provides a sort of amazing cover for the soil. So after it does rain, it provides a nice microclimate of shade, which helps stop evaporation out here in the desert and allows that water to sink in. You can see there's a difference between the soil here in the overgrowth than the soil that's completely unprotected. So I'm gonna keep at it out here and cutting this down and it's gonna provide an amazing sort of ground cover mulch for this desert soil. Perfect time to take advantage of this. But you can see how important the vegetation is out here in the desert. And even though it didn't rain last night, you can see the dew on all these leaves. Little water collectors. And that eventually funnels down into the soil. You see how these processes just layer on one another to help the desert soil. And of course the dogs enjoy the shorter grass, weeds. <laughs> it's a much more comfortable place to uh, lay down and enjoy their bones. Now that we've been living on this property for several years, observing the land and kind of getting to know it, we've been putting more of our plans into action for earthworks and specific intentional ways of working with the land that ultimately benefits not only us, but everything around us. Our goal is to work with the forces and cycles in nature so we don't have to struggle against them. Before our last big rainstorm, I was in a kind of a funk for a while and something just didn't feel right. I didn't understand what I was feeling, so I just ignored it. There's a storm brewing. And then the storm hit. Two and a half inches of rain fell overnight and our root cellar collapsed from flooding. You know, I often get stuck in my own head. I overthink things, I get distracted. I become impatient, frustrated, anxious, judgmental. And sometimes I end up missing the most important things. If I would have just quieted my mind a little and listened to what my heart had been trying to tell me, I might have avoided a big disappointment and a lot of extra work. I don't think my mind will ever make a good leader. It wants to judge, fret, get defensive and anxious. It tries to call the shots and figure things out, but it will never be able to figure out all of life in its infinite complexity, especially when it's coming from this little finite box and a place of fear. My heart, on the other hand, makes a much better leader. In fact, it has never led me astray. My heart's coming from a place of love and infinite wisdom. Perhaps the best decision in my life was moving here, quitting my job, and devoting my life to what brings me joy and helps me help others, including all the plants, animals, the land, and people in the ways that I'm best able to. That decision came from following my heart, not my head. In fact, in my mind, I was terrified and full of doubt, but in my heart, it just felt right. And I've never regretted that decision. I think it can be easy to miss what our heart is telling us if we're not paying attention. Usually for me, it's kind of like a gentle whisper or a soft light that's guiding the way. And I think you can know that it's your heart that's guiding you if it leads you to somewhere positive. It lifts you from darkness and gives a sense of peace, joy, hope, comfort, and assurance. It always leads you exactly where you need to go. And often that place is better than your mind could ever even imagine. Work continues with the root cellar and getting the area around that ready. I think the next move I really want to make is getting some earthworks around here. I think we're going to be putting in a combination of a bunch of basins with spillways, which would cover sort of like the north and the west 
areas of the domes and I think that'll provide amazing protection. The plan is fantastic. I can't wait to get started. I think it'll work out pretty nicely. The, the plans we have for this is uh, probably a bit overkill, but I'd rather overkill this time than, of course, what happened with the root cellar the last time. You're right. <laughs> so it'll be a matter of sort of building up the areas around these foundations and allowing water to infiltrate these basins. And it'll serve multiple purposes too because not only will it drain water away from the house and, um, and prevent water from getting up close to the foundation, but we're gonna be growing some things around that area. We'll have a garden and we'll have some trees. So thanks so much for watching. Catch you on the next video, everyone. Bye.